It was early 2013, and we had just launched a really exciting startup. We were convinced that we were going to revolutionize how video was going to get made. I was so convinced that I was sure that as soon as YouTube would discover us, they'd want to partner with us or even acquire us. I was busy doing the rounds with all the venture capitalists in Los Angeles and Silicon Valley. I went to Sand Hill Road, the mecca of venture capital. And the feedback was pretty consistent. They liked the idea, just show us traction, and then come back to us and talk about funding. But yet, how could I get users and traction if I didn't have funding? And how could I get funding if I didn't have the users? I was stuck in that conundrum that so many startups face. And I was getting discouraged. A week later, we had a lucky break. We were invited to a hackathon, which are these software coding competitions where large companies organize to see fresh ideas, talent. And at that hackathon, we met two YouTube engineers. They seemed generally impressed with what we were building. And we got a huge breakthrough. They invited us to Google I.O. Google I.O., for those of you who don't know, is the event of the year for Google. It's the one time where they, once a year, they invite all the press, all the engineering community, and showcase all the software and hardware they're going to show that year. This was huge, because it's hard enough to just go as a spectator, but getting to exhibit there is really extraordinary. I quickly called all the venture capitalists that were sort of on the fence with us and said, see, we're the real deal. We just got invited to Google I.O. I let everyone know, friends, family, and the show was amazing. When we got there, it just so happened that Google was launching their Google Glass. And I tweeted for one of the first times, and I was convinced that these two technologies might change the world. Or would they? <laughs> we went back to LA with a big stack of business cards and feeling pretty optimistic. I quickly started contacting all the people that we had met. And the response was mm, lukewarm. All my friends were calling and saying, how'd it go? Did you guys get any investments? Did you guys partner? I tried to put a positive spin on it. But the reality is, failure stings. I still cringe a little bit when I look at this tweet. It's embarrassing and debilitating. And worst of all, you doubt yourself. Was I just not capable enough? Was I not smart enough to make this startup work? And I realized, you know, first of all, if you're raising money and you have a big event, don't share it, because you can always share good news, but don't, don't build up unnecessary expectation. But the, the other thing is, when you start off on a path, on a new venture, you might think that getting from point A to point B is relatively st straightforward. But the reality is, with everything in life, it's a little more complicated. There are a lot of twists and turns and trials and tribulations. That's just part of the course. It took me a while to recover from that and realize that, you know, I had heard all these anecdotes, turn failure into opportunity, stumbling box into stepping stones. And I appreciated the kernel of truth in those. But how? I was missing a methodology, a tool, how do you turn those failures into opportunity? And I realized there are a set of three actions that, especially taken together, can really help transform failure into learning and opportunity. The first is about mindset, and I call it the Maximilian Rule. Max is my 18-month-old son, and a couple months ago, he took his first steps. It's amazing how much we can learn from babies. They're in the growth business. They have no self-imposed limitations. They just try. It's painful to watch. They fall. They hurt themselves. But they adjust. Their, their muscles get stronger. Their cognitive abilities adapt. And they keep going. And they never go to bed at night thinking, I wish I tried a little harder. <laughs> and a good embodiment of the Maximilian rule is Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan had that same winning mindset. He didn't make the high school varsity team. He lost 300 games, missed 9,000 shots, was entrusted with 26 game-changing shots, and missed all of them. But when he's asked about his success, 
He said, that's what made me successful. It was the learning in those failures. And that takes me to point number two. The second key action is deliberate reflection. It's important once we have failure to have a post-mortem, really reflect on what happened. What was the context? What were the causes? What can we learn? What would we do different if we encounter that situation again? And a really good place to look is science. Scientists are in the discovery business. They're in the business of gaining new knowledge, and they have an approach which we study at school, the scientific method, which is really a structured approach to starting off not with a fact, but with an observation, a hypothesis, that then gets tested with real data. And that empirical data informs our hypothesis. It's a virtuous cycle. And what, where, where we failed at Google I.O. is not that we didn't get funding or that we didn't get a partnership. We didn't learn. We, were, we had this unique opportunity to ask the most important community in our space, are we focusing on the right problem? Are we approaching it in the right way? Would you pay for our services? And you might ask, why? And we were even oblivious to the fact that in Silicon Valley, they don't even use the word failure. They use the word pivot, which is exactly that. You start off in a direction with the best knowledge you have, you test it, you get market validation, and then you pivot, you adjust and move on. So why didn't we ask those questions? Definitely it was a little bit of inexperience, maybe a little bit of arrogance. But ultimately it was fear. It was fear of being wrong. And that fear blocked our progress. And ultimately, that's lack of accountability. When I think of accountability, there's one image that comes to mind. This was 2013, a critical game between the Lakers and the Golden State Warriors. Four minutes to the end of the game, the Lakers were down by two points. Kobe Bryant jumps up, gets fouled, falls down, falls down and rips his Achilles tendon. He gets back up, hobbles to the free throw line, and proceeds to make the next two baskets. He's then helped off the court to get surgery. That moment that got him back up, he didn't do it for the fans, for the Lakers. He did it for himself. Early in his career, he decided what kind of player he wanted to be and the legacy he wanted to leave. And it's that accountability to that legacy that got him back up and scored that. He was not going to let a ripped Achilles tendon get hit in the way of his legacy. Exactly two years ago, November 30th, 2017, I had an interesting experience. I rode on the corporate jet for the first time. This was a different company, by the way. And do you know how you spot the guy who doesn't own the jet? The guy taking the selfie. <laughs> <laughs> the excitement of being on the jet lasted about an hour and a half. It was an awesome experience. But as we settled in and I was watching our flight path, on the screen, I realized that my internal compass was saying that I was off course, that I wasn't really on the right path to happiness that I sought. And I had a unique time for reflection. What seemed maybe from the outside that I was at the height of my career, I was actually on the cusp of a bigger and deeper failure. Happiness is different for all of us, and it's dynamic. It changes as we grow. But there was one quote by Eleanor Roosevelt that always resonated with me. And the essence of this quote is the purpose of life. And really, it's, the purpose is to live life at its utmost. And to do so, we need to be fearless in reaching out for more meaningful experiences. And I realized on that flight that I was not doing that. I was diverging away from that. So in that moment of clarity, I decided that if I wasn't happy with the trajectory I was on, I had to take responsibility and make a change. So 10 months later, my wonderful family and I moved to Florence. <laughs> and so I'd like to, for you to take a second and think about the trajectory of your own life. Visualize your happiness, visualize your success. Now, everyone in this room will fall into two groups. The first group 
will be successful. You will be, not necessarily have achieved all your goals. You will encounter failure, but you will understand that failure is not a permanent condition. It's a ne necessary path forward. The second group, you will stumble, you will stagnate, and you might blame externalities, other factors for your lack of happiness. Now, one single action on how you view failure, your mindset, your reflection, how you learn from it, and your accountability, how you ultimately respond to it, will determine which group you're in. Thank you.